Hello everyone, I'm Marcus O'Brien, Vice President of AutoCAD, and you're listening to the AutoCAD Podcast. In this series, we'll give you an in-depth view of all things AutoCAD, recording live here from AU Expo Floor. In this episode of the AutoCAD Podcast, you will hear from Nicholas Bonnet and Dan Whitcomb as we go behind the scenes of the innovative features and powerful capabilities that drive AutoCADs towards the future of design. We talk about automated design, the powerful insights being generated by our new insights engine, and take a deep dive into some of the techniques we use to deliver the right insight to the right person at the right time. I hope you enjoy the episode. Before we get started on our podcast today, we need to talk a little bit about a safe harbor statement. Some of the things that we talk about here, they're true as of now, but we don't want you to make any purchasing decisions based on the statements made. Software changes frequently, and we've no control over what might happen in future, so that's part of our legal requirement here that we talk about our safe harbor statement. Today I'm very excited because with me I've got Dan Whitcomb. He's a senior product manager for AutoCAD Desktop. He has been with the AutoCAD team since 2020 after successfully completing an internship at the AutoCAD PM team in 2019. He graduated with an MBA from the Yale School of Management, and a Master of Architecture from Yale School of Architecture. He received his Bachelor's Degree in Architecture in Yale in 2012. Dan is a long-time AutoCAD user and enthusiast, having worked as a designer for four years as an architectural firm in New Haven and New York, focusing primarily on high-end commercial and residential interiors. As a product manager on the AutoCAD team, Dan has worked closely with Autodesk's Insight Delivery Team to help customers become more proficient and efficient users of AutoCAD through new and product AutoCAD features and dashboards. He's also spearheaded the development of new machine learning based automations that help users design and draft more quickly and efficiently. Dan lives in San Francisco with his partner and miniature schnauzer, Leonard, who's adorable, always on our Zoom calls. He loves traveling through California and beyond and has become an avid hiker since he moved here to the Bay Area. Dan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. How are you doing? Doing great. Excited to be here. How's your AU been going? It's been going great. Overwhelming. There's a lot to see the first time. You know, the past few AUs have been virtual. And it's a completely yeah. different experience in person. So I was, you know, you, you, you came as an intern in 2019 and that was kind of um, pre-COVID and we had you in the office. I was surprised talking to you yesterday, the number of people you hadn't met before, like face to face. You were kind of get, having all these... Tell me a little bit about that, about being at a company for such a long time and, and, and finally getting to see people. Yeah, no, it's great to be, you know, being in person allows you to connect yourself to the actual company, to the people, be able to have the conversations organically that you can't have when you're logging in on a meeting and logging off. Right. Um, there are efficiencies to jumping into a Zoom meeting, but there's also things missed, like the casual conversations you can have. So Casual it's, podcast conversation. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> super easy. Easiest way to have a totally. chat. Um, tell me about customers. So you've, you know, kind of, uh, you've been leading, and we're going to talk about this, but some of our, um, you know, most innovative features with this ML-based uh, insight drafting. But what's it like talking to customers and kind of, you know, you've been doing a lot of that over Zoom and, uh, it, you know, what's different about being in person here at AU? Yeah, you get a lot more from customers. You know, you are, you know, the, the nature of those casual conversations that you can't get when you're on Zoom. When you're on Zoom, you're, you're meeting with them for a specific reason, right? right? And you're getting specific information. But when yeah. you're here in person... You get everything. You get yeah. the information you want and then some. Yeah. And so you learn a lot more. Yeah, it's great. I've really been enjoying it. It's so good to be back. Um, let's talk a little bit about kind of what brought you to AutoCAD yeah. before we get started. Give us a little, we got a little bit of a taste for it in your bio, but, but, but what brought you here? Yeah, so for a long time, I knew I wanted to be around architecture and design. That's really my bread and butter. But I knew I wanted to do things differently and affect the industry differently. And so I went and got my business degree as well as my architecture degree. I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. And then one day, you know, as an AutoCAD user, I stumbled on a job listing that I'm sure you posted uh, for <laughs> an internship with the AutoCAD team. And I said, that's a great opportunity to kind of test out the water. So I was definitely looking to be at Autodesk before I was looking to be a product manager. And it all kind of came together in the right way. Tell, uh, you know, without going into detail on it, though, but what did your internship kind of center around? What were you working on for us? Yeah, so uh, I was working on doing customer research around a new uh, capability to um, understand how people use their drawings and how they move between different drawings and copy drawings and what kind of uh, application that could have. And it's been really exciting to see that evolve and and turn into different features and different opportunities. Uh, to, some, to some degree, it was kind of foundational towards some of the things that we're doing now as well. So yeah. yeah. You've been here for the long haul. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Uh, I learned a couple of things about you last night, a couple of facts. Um, one is that you're an avid karaoke fan and that you have, you on your phone keep a list of songs for the, in the event that you're called upon to do a karaoke so that you don't, yeah. You gotta be ready. You gotta be ready at all times. times. Yeah, no, obviously, who doesn't have that list? 
my favorite list that you have first of all love that you've lists for everything <laughs> my favorite list you has is a list of celebrities that you have seen where you record the date and the context in which you saw them yeah and and i thought it would be like one or two celebrities it's like a three page scroll of celebrities that's a lot of celebrities makes me seem a little bit crazy but you know what just a little bit it's fine <laughs> but you know there's rules behind the list and you know i want there was a list person i met and i showed him the list and he was like this is before i recorded date and, and context and he's like mm-hmm. you got to add details yeah you got to otherwise details. otherwise just a name exactly. what are you doing here then exactly love it okay let's talk about why we're here let's talk about autocad so to kick things off can you go through AutoCAD 23 features and kind of the automation and machine learning capabilities. Yeah, totally. So uh, you've talked about it in the past, but um, really two big features that came out in AutoCAD 2023. Um, so there's the markup import and assist feature, which for the first time is using machine learning and uh, OCR to automate the process of bringing markups, which are a very, very natural and common part of the design and drafting workflow into AutoCAD. The other one is called the Macro Advisor, which I work directly on, which, and you'll hear more later uh, with Nicola, but it helps users in the moment find the automations that they need, particularly macros, by understanding how these users work and delivering them uh, automations that they might not realize that they need in the moment and giving them right in the context of their work. Can you do a little bit of a click down on that? So Marco Pimport and it says, tell us, tell us what might be a workflow or kind of what are we trying to achieve there? Yeah, so... Uh, when in the process of design, you know, you there's multiple people involved. You know, it's not a one-person thing that happens and boom, it's out in the world, right? You have to print out drawings, get them reviewed. And part of that review process is your manager or somebody senior writing down, here's what you need to change, either digitally or physically. And so what this is doing, what you usually have to do is take those and one by one by hand, go and make those changes. What this is allowing you to do is take those changes that you want in the finished document and review those and see those and allow those to be automatically placed into the drawing as AutoCAD objects. And how much of that is kind of part of more hybrid remote work, like that we're seeing more and more of our customers working from home, working on different devices, and they're, they're trying to collaborate over DWGs. Is this a, a, new, a new need, we feel? Or? Well, definitely the digital aspect of it, sure. I feel. You know, for a while you're in the office and you're doing it by hand and paper, but I think the working from home has really transformed the industry in terms of what they feel they can do, right? Mm-hmm. And what they feel they can do online or uh, over Zoom or something. So the digital markups that we're seeing are definitely newer and allow us a lot of opportunity to help them as in that process. Wonderful. So as a, a former designer yourself, how do you think machine learning and automation will change the way that buildings are built? Yeah, uh, in radical ways. I think that fortunately we're in a position at Autodesk that we affect so much of the industry so we're able to deliver these automations for these tasks that designers are constantly having to do. That's not part of design. That's not what they're trained to do. Mm-hmm. And so what they're trained to do is, is the creative output, is the it, make the building, figure out what the building looks like. And they don't want to be copying and rotating and doing things over and over and over again, things that take time. And not only are we able to automate those things, but people don't necessarily know the things that that are taking time for them, right? We're able to understand with the Insights program what is taking time, how do you fix that, how do you serve that in the moment in order to help these users. Mm -hmm. I love it. Uh, We had Danyan yesterday who was talking about exactly what you're talking about, which is removing repetitive, you know, we've been doing automation in AutoCAD forever, right? It's in the name. But being able to find those things, those areas where customers don't even know that there's opportunities to it and serving those things up is a way to really delight customers. What I think what we're finding, right, is that as customers use these features, they're, you know, as, as, as basic as some of them may be, they're absolutely blown away. They're like, that is going to save me, you know, 20% of my time to be able to automate totally. those things. So, totally. Super interesting. Tell me a little bit about connected paper. So where does that fit into everything? Yeah, so connected paper is really a first step into one of these common workflows. And again, these automations. So connected paper, also markup, import, and assist, really starts to take that manual, like I said, that manual process of, of the taking the time and the actual physical paper, which mm-hmm. we should be, as an, on the Autodesk side, really helping users move away from those kind of things that, yeah. you know, take resources. And so it really is a first step towards automating a whole entire type of workflow. Sure. And we're helping users on that path. That's, did, tell me about that workflow. So tell me about, I mean, we, this has been something we've built towards for years as well. As much as connected paper is like a first step, mm-hmm. there's a lot of capabilities like the DWG compare, 
things with you know trace and it, it kind of evolved over time right? totally. this has been a long-term plan right mm-hmm. we've been building towards this tell me a little bit more about that workflow then yeah so it, what it allows you to do the actual feature yeah the, the workflow so um what a user can do is let's say you have a digital or physical markup and i think that's really the amazing part of this is that it works for both it sure it's users where they are right yeah so you have a, what we call in the industry red lines on a paper and you are able to take a photo of the markups on your phone and get those red lines right into AutoCAD Mobile or AutoCAD Web and then uh, absorb those in AutoCAD Desktop as actual markups. And again, physical and digital. So if you have the same thing done on a PDF, you have those digital markups, you're able, somebody says, add a door right here or you know some kind of note or tag, you're able to get that tag right as an AutoCAD geometry right into the drawing without having to manually translate it from the physical or the you know the markup outside of AutoCAD and right. doing that entire workflow in AutoCAD and keep you connected to the ecosystem. This feature for me is the is the first one where we really took advantage of desktop web mobile where we we thought about a workflow and we thought about the use cases for each of the OSs and and situations where people use them if you're on an iPad or if you're on the web and we we built a feature around that and I think you know, I've certainly learned a lot from that as we've done it. So I think, you know, definitely more of that to come. Yeah, and, 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 yeah. and I don't want to dis- discount the value of the trace feature completely as the foundation of all of this. Because the yeah. trace not only allows us to do markup, import, and assist, but trace can go many different directions and empower a lot of different things. Um, so what are the implications, you think, to other industries of kind of where, you know, this, this push towards ML and kind of insight-based design is, is going? Yeah, so, you know, people that use AutoCAD are not just engineers and architects, right? You know, it affects, the way I explain to my family what AutoCAD is, is look around, anything physical that you see, likely AutoCAD touched it in some <laughs> way, right? I love that. So, I love that conversation. You're like that they owe you a thanks or something. Exactly. You're, you're welcome, yeah, family. Your yeah. house. You're right? like your watch, dad. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Um, but so <laughs> it, it impacts everybody because these workflows, and I think that's one thing that's great about these is it's not specific to one type of industry, right? Sure. It is specific to how people use our product and how mm-hmm. things get built. Yeah. And that's what's really valuable about what we're doing here is that it impacts everybody at different skill levels um, and industries. Love it. Let's just do a little bit of a deep dive on the macro advisor. So we saw Amy Bunzel on main stage yesterday talking about the new capabilities of the macro advisor and how offering up these insights in a workflow can be really powerful. Can you tell me a little bit about how you identify those macros, how you know a good macro from a bad macro? Kind of, kind of just peel back the cover a little bit and tell us a bit about that. Yeah, there's a lot of work that went into it by a lot of people. So we were able to identify this as a valuable workflow because the insights team had done extensive customer research about how this could be valuable. And so what we were able to do is then look, use machine learning to look at uh, anonymized command data from, I believe it was Canada, for a week and just get a, a snapshot of how people use AutoCAD and then use machine learning to identify patterns in that, common patterns from different people and then have those patterns those that were discovered using machine learning uh, reviewed by a subject matter expert who basically said yes, no, yes, no to things that would be valuable and then fed that back into the loop and got it smarter and smarter and smarter and curated about, I think we have 40 different macros that we can serve up to the user based on their data at any given time. Train, I think it's super interesting, the training of the ML models and how, how it's, an, it's still an art. Uh, it's, not, it's not an exact science still. There's still uh, that human input part that makes things better. So the fact that we had AutoCAD experts and people that were able to say this is this macro is maybe a little bit less useful than this other one and kind of help train that algorithm as well. Yeah, Yeah. and it'll be great. You know, this is, again, I keep talking about first steps, but that's how machine learning works. It's iterative. And, you know, maybe one day, who knows, we can serve you custom macros in the moment based solely on the commands you use. But uh, we we have to get there. I love it. Understand what users like. Um, tell me, we, we have to be a little bit careful about what we talk about publicly, but, but how are these features doing? You know, we're kind of, we, we ship um, a lot of capabilities in AutoCAD. How are we finding these ML-based insights are doing? People love it. Yeah. People love it. I'll talk specifically about the insights. And I think one thing that's really exciting about the insights feature is it's one of the first live features in AutoCAD that we can change and adjust and understand what's working, what's not, what macros are used and what's not and when do we want to deliver it to users we can change that we don't have to wait for autocad 2029 in order to do that right we can do it tomorrow and that's a really new way of delivering a feature in autocad brilliant 
Last one, let's, uh, we're moving towards the end here, but if you talk a little bit, but um, for our customers, how do you envision future insights kind of changing the way that they design? Where yeah. does this go in the next iteration? Yeah, so insights can take on many forms, right? So right now, a lot of the insights we're delivering are uh, single time absorbable, right? We help you in your workflow. We say, do this, not that. And once you do it, you know, we send you another insight. But where we see insights being really valuable is what if we can be continuously valuable to the users? So not just delivering insights about usage, but delivering insights about the way your files are working. Who is touching this file? And maybe you want to go pay attention to that. And that can mm -hmm. be endlessly valuable and continuously valuable all along the your project delivery workflow. Metadata around the file, not just in the file. Exactly. Too, right? Like the, the data that surrounds it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Dan, it's been a complete pleasure. Before I let you go, I'd like to do two things. One, what's your favorite feature? It can't be one that you've worked on. Can't so be what, one. what is it? What, tell me something about AutoCAD, that one of your features that you're just like, yeah, that's my go-to. So uh, I'll talk about a feature that I never even worked on, but I think is so elegant, and that's the count feature, which nice. is an automation in its own, right? Yeah. And it's just this beautiful feature that is able to save users so much time by counting their blocks, and we can evolve that, and, and it's just one of those... Tell us what the feature does oh, first. So of course. So the count feature, uh, let's say you have 30 different uh, chairs of one specification in your drawing. You're able to literally click a button and get a count, get a table of how many of those chairs you need to order, right? And it's just, it, and the technology that's used to do that is going to power not only that feature, but so many more things down the line. So uh, Foundational stuff. Exactly. I, and I think, yeah, I think you touched on something there that we didn't really talk about, but it's not always the right idea to just use ML just because you can. I feel like when you look at what's happening in uh, tech in general right now, there's a, uh, ML is overused. And if you can build an elegant algorithm that can do the job, you should. And that you should, you know, ML should be used sparingly. So count is a great example of a feature where we looked at it. We could have done ML with that. And we were like, actually, we think we can serve this better as an automation. Mm -hmm. So fantastic. Okay. We end all of our podcasts with this or that. And I don't know if you've heard these before. But I've got a, a serious, some hard-hitting questions here that I want to finish this up with before you go away. Okay, ready? Absolutely. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Coffee. Ribbon or command line? Command line, all the way. Lisp or macros? Macros. Enter button, space bar, or right click? Enter button. That's the first one of those we got. Okay. Uh, light mode or dark mode? Dark mode, but I could see myself dabbling in light mode. Tell me, when would be an example of life I don't like know. a dabble? You just want a, a little change, you know? You're, it, a little something. You're feeling brighter. It's a Sunday. Yeah, exactly. Let's do it. Exactly. Yeah, let's go crazy exactly. here. Okay. <laughs> Groups or blocks? Ooh. Ooh. Groups, but I should be using blocks. <laughs> yeah, that's your breaking the rules. Floating, floating tabs tile or tab in a second monitor? Oh, tab in a second monitor. Great. And then last one, dogs or cats? Dogs. Loyalty All to Leonard. Way. Miniature All schnauzers. Way. Yeah, adorable. <laughs> Dan, it's been a pleasure. I really Thank appreciate you, so you taking much the for time. Having me. Okay, it's been great. Welcome back to the AutoCAD podcast. I'm Marcus O'Brien, Vice President of Product for AutoCAD, and I'm here with Nicola Bonet. Nicola is currently the Senior Director of Product Analytics at Autodesk. His team is devoted to driving data-driven practices and services throughout the company, including the research and development of my insights in AutoCAD. He has a lifelong passion for analytics and performance measurement. After receiving a master's degree in applied mathematics and computer science, Nicola left academia and spent 15 years as a data analyst. He then made a big shift into the entrepreneurial world and co-founded a company to build analytic platforms. After his company was acquired by Oracle, he continued his work there before getting a taste of what it would be to lead product teams in a startup focused on consumer mobile apps. Nicholas owns and holds two US patents for his innovative work. Nicola is an avid soccer fan. We're going to talk about that in a while, Nicola. Ooh. And he has volunteered as a soccer coach for many years. Born and raised in Paris, France, Nicola moved to California 25 years ago. He loves to travel. And now that he's an empty nester, there's many more opportunities to do that. Welcome to the podcast, Nicola. Oh, thank you. Thanks for coming here. Are you, you know, your first trip without you know, the kids at home? It's fantastic. Enjoying it. <laughs> That's great. I feel like you might have put into your bio specifically. I, I think I might have read your bio before and it didn't have anything about football. And now because I'm interviewing you, you've just enforced this in here. Why, why do you feel it's important that we talk about how much of an avid soccer fan you are on this AutoCAD podcast? It's always a good you know, sports team. It's very good yeah. relationship between countries. Give me some examples of where those things might go wrong. I can think of a couple. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, I actually think it's a, you know, sports is a fantastic way for cultures. Yeah, I agree. And to have, you know, intensity in relationships and sometimes drama. And there's a little bit of drama between France and Ireland. What happened in 2009 between France and Ireland? Oh, I think Ireland didn't do a, go to the World Cup because we... You know, cheated a bit on a game. And, there was a very, you know, very famous, very hand, famous, a very yeah. famous handball incident where Thierry Henry, a, a, a legend on the French uh, soccer team, uh, handball uh, incident, and it resulted in France going through to the qualifiers and Ireland not. And France winning the World Cup. And France winning the, the World Cup. Yeah, so we owe you a lot. Uh, thank you very so much. So I did read. I did read on Wikipedia. It says that to get the obvious out of the way, the Thierry Henry handball sent France into the main draw and meant that Ireland would miss out on the finals. Some would say that this changed the course of history, which it did, just not in a groundbreaking way. Unless you ask a football fan from Ireland. So there you go. Absolutely. It, it, Ireland it was right. never going to get to the finals. So if there was going to, if, if someone had to get there and Henri had to do it to get there, I say go for it. That's Irish humility right there, <laughs> and we really appreciate it. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about AutoCAD. Uh, but before we talk in the detail of AutoCAD, you've got a, a, a vast, a long history here in data analytics. So well, let's, you know, in your own words, let's step back. What brought you to Autodesk? All right. Uh, what brought me to Autodesk is um, the purpose of the products and the opportunity for data. I'm, I'm a data geek at heart. I love to get into data, find the potential of data, helping users, you know, understanding their, you know, what they're struggling with in the data and try to give them insights and recommendations. I really love that. I love to see how people learn and how we can help with data. And there's so much data here and data that we can use for a great purpose. It's not mm -hmm. about, you know, selling more stuff it's not about advertisement it's really purpose that is really beautiful so that brought me here i think there's so much to do with yeah here. and when you came here i mean just to talk about kind of where you are in autodesk as well you're you're responsible for creating something across all of our products you know and yep. it, um, within the aec space uh, initially and what was it about autocad you were a big advocate for kind of getting these insights into autocad initially yeah. what was what was it that drove that I think of AutoCAD and like many of the products at Autodesk, like a very complex language that you have to learn throughout your whole life. And maybe also as a, as a foreigner, something that attracted me, there's so much to learn about how you practice that language. And when I see my kids in learning in a bilingual environment and see how they learn, I find it's the same thing. You have to learn that complex language. And there's so many things you can do with that language. And over time, you get more and more proficient. And I felt like this is an incredible incredible opportunity. There's so much data, um, so many various use cases, so many phrases right. that, you know, people can compose mm -hmm. with this data and we can help them along the way to say, hey, there might be a few concepts that you can learn along the way. You can be a bit more proficient with your words. Mm -hmm. And so that, that metaphorically really attracted me. I think that the potential is absolutely enormous. I totally agree. Okay, tell me a little bit about the Insights program, kind of what, what it's all about and, and, you know, why does it exist in the first place? Like, why is this something that we're doing? I think it, it, it goes back to my statement here. It exists because the language is complex. You mm -hmm. know, there's 2,000 commands in, in AutoCAD. Nobody can say they, they master all those, you know, commands and sequence of commands. So I think we probably have one or two customers, maybe, honestly. We probably do. That probably do, <laughs> but, you know, so... yeah. So again, so that that's really the um, the you know the the, the potential here. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, learning learning all of this and helping customers. So the idea is to observe a user as they you know issue commands mm -hmm. and identify patterns uh, that you know more proficient users are are using or repetitive tasks that we could help them. You know, over time. So we think of ourselves as like an assistant, somebody who can give you advice mm -hmm. at the right time, mm -hmm. whenever you need it. So sometimes right. the advice is you know, once you're done and you're wrapping up your day, or sometimes the advice is in the moment. Yeah. And we need to be really clever about this, but of we're course. trying to, you know, figure out when to say, when to give the advice by really observing, having empathy with the user and delivering the right advice at the right time. Exactly. I think it is a very difficult landscape to navigate because when we think back to things like Clippy, do you remember yep, Clippy? Absolutely. Ding, ding, do you want yep, help? Absolutely. And, and how annoying that became. You know, I think it's getting the right insight to the right person at the right time where it's not affecting their workflow. It's actually making them more productive. I think that's a yep. very difficult thing to judge. And I think yep. that we're going cautiously and, and making sure that we, we, we pop those insights at the right time, right? That's yep. a big part of what we're doing. 
You're absolutely right. We have to be right about our advice, but also right about our delivery. Sometimes mm -hmm. you're, you know, and as a dad, I know that. You know, many times I heard it from my kids. You know, I may, I might be right about my advice, but wrong about my delivery. <laughs> and and that's you're only right if you're right about in yeah, both cases. That's and right. That's really very important to understand the user flows and understand when to deliver those. Great. So a couple of things you need in order to be able to build successful um, ML algorithms is you need a big chunk of data and you need the right algorithm to be able to train it. Tell us a little bit about the data that you're using to build those insights. So you, you kind of alluded to it, but yeah. So it's, um, first of all, I think it's important to understand the scale of what we're doing. There's, um, on a daily basis, you know, 25 billion commands that are issued by AutoCAD users throughout the world. It's, it's an enormous amount of data. So you see me smile. It's, I love data. I love big data. So this is really, really nice. Huge so, data. Huge <laughs> data. We can swim in it and, and find patterns. And yeah. there's nothing more exciting for me and my team. Great. So from there, essentially, we're trying to make sense out of this data to find mm -hmm. pattern in, in the data. So you think of it as manipulating big matrices of data, try to understand, to so have users who issue commands and users who like me, use the same commands at the same frequency. Mm -hmm. And if you can group that into an, and find an algorithm, say, well, you know, people who use those commands also use that other command that you don't use. So similar to movie recommendations, but for commands, right? Mm -hmm. And if we do this at scale, we can highlight commands that might be relevant uh, to you. And they are, you know, in the feedback that we're getting is absolutely positive. People say, yeah, that's a very interesting command. I've right. never used it. Yeah, um, I've used the product for a really long yeah. time and I never knew you could yeah. do that. We had yeah. people who uh, told us, like, use the product for 17 years and yeah. got into habits and that didn't realize that command was a more, a better use, um, you know, than the other commands. So yeah. It's more efficient. So, what, what do we say it's to some of those, you know, there's 25 billion commands issued every day. I'm sure some people listening are thinking, Nicola is sitting there watching my every command individually you know my ip is at stake here or how, how can we put people's minds at ease in terms of uh, their ip and their commands and the the abstraction of that data from their from their, who they are and what they're doing that's a question but the first thing is to establish the a trusted relationship we we want this um, we want to help by analyzing that data and giving back to you as an insight so it's like a trusted relationship with whoever you share data with. Mm -hmm. That's really important. The second part to understand is that we don't know who the users are. It's just a, a anonymous data. We have a user ID and a set of commands that are issued by that user. ID. Nobody in, in, in my team knows who that user is. Right. And, and so that's a very important element. And so we also, that, that's a, a key thing from a trusted relationship to deliver to run those algorithms without having any chance of knowing who the user is. And mm -hmm. the third thing that is very important is to keep in mind that sort of metaphorically, I, I say that we know how you handle the hammer, but we don't know what you do with a hammer. Right. We don't know what you design. Right. We just know the steps that you take to do something. Yeah. And we monitor those steps, but we have no idea what you're designing. So ultimately, it's really kind of surface level. We mm -hmm. want to make sure that you handle the tools yeah. right with the tools that we provide yeah. as, a, as a vendor yeah. that we want to make sure that you use, use them well we also want to understand when we can improve those tools yeah. sometimes if we see like the macro is a good example you see a series of command that people keep doing yeah from there you say well maybe we can create a either a macro but of course new commands that can can evolve from can this. evolve from this absolutely so you know it's just observing people's behavior and trying to help them out mm -hmm. When I think about when this found, you know, when when you joined and and uh, all the conversations we were having at the start and kind of, you know, people today are voting with their data. They they trust companies and they don't trust others. And I think that that people are much more aware of where they put their data and what they allow to happen with their data, and the amount of thought and systems and governance we put in place yeah. before we even started Absolutely. going through the data uh, to make sure that we we met our bar in terms of of trust and what we would expect in, in terms of high integrity with the data. So I just want to make sure that we've, you know, we're doing incredible things and we're being able to offer these insights because you're trusting us with your data and you can trust us Absolutely. with your data. And, yeah. and this is why we, we proceed very carefully mm -hmm. um, with the uh, utmost respect for, you know, those concerns, you know, around data privacy and all that. So can you, uh, you know, kind of a click down, can you tell me kind of what, what kind of machine learning techniques are used to build those insights and, you know, 
yep. kind of at a basic level, but but I but explain it. Yeah, there's no basic level. You don't how want deep me to go, we go here? all geeky and, and give like. <laughs> well, I kind of do. I want to see how deep right, this goes, right. but yeah, let's start <laughs> at that. Yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, there's multiple kinds of algorithms that we use for different kinds of insights. So I mentioned two, and I think I can talk a little bit about math at a high level behind mm -hmm. behind the two. The command recommendation, as I mentioned, is uh, like a movie recommendation. So Think of it as, you know, in math, we call it, we put all that data in a big matrix. It's a matrix of users, uh, you know, those are the rows, and then the commands are the columns. And in the middle is the frequency of use of that user over a period of time. Mm -hmm. And then we do what we call matrix factorization, which is essentially try to reorganize the matrix so that people with the same frequency are together. So user one, two, three, and have the similar frequencies for command A, B, C mm -hmm. are grouped together. Mm -hmm. And so essentially it's the way we run that algorithm. Yeah. And then we find opportunities to say, well, there's a command that user A doesn't use. So it's a lot of work on matrices yeah. for the algorithm to find those patterns. And this beautifully changes over time. Mm -hmm. so it's not a static thing. Sure. As people continue to use more commands, as we yeah. introduce more commands, the matrix changes, yeah. and then we can make new recommendation accordingly. So that's an example of a massive amount of data. Yeah. Just two thousand commands. Yeah. You know, there's lots a lot of, of users. iterations, or yes. yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah, and users who use those commands. You know, it's, it's tremendous amount. Mm -hmm. uh, Super interesting, really. How much of how much of uh, what you do is is through like alpha and beta feedback groups as well, from talking to customers directly? So. A tremendous amount of research. Uh, we're working with some customers proactively mm -hmm. in beta mode to understand. It. There's one thing to think, oh, this is a highly insightful recommendation, which we always think we are insightful. Nailed it. And nailed yeah. it. And then you put it in front of the subject matter expert and say, yeah. wow, yeah, that's yeah. okay. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> that's, thank you. <laughs> so we're, we're working with some customers who want to engage with us. They, yeah. they understood the power, uh, the potential of that system, and they're mm -hmm. reaching out to us to work and to make sure that those recommendations are fine-tuned. There's always a subject matter expert that look at those at a high level. What are the commands that are worth recommending mm -hmm. to certain kind of users? What are also for the macro. So we also always have a human in a loop to make sure we are as insightful as we can Right, maybe. yeah. I think, I think that combination of, like I talked with Dan earlier about, you still need to have the, you know, the, the master chef or the fine tuner Absolutely. or the person who you know, can, can make the call on if yeah. this is a good insight or yeah. not. It's yeah, we, we would not recommend you to do undo, right. even though a lot of people do people undo. People love undo. We should do it undo. for everybody. We should do it for everybody, right? <laughs> but we don't do that. You know, it's a great example. Experts. Uh, last question um, before I let you go, but you know, look look forward a little bit. We have to be careful about forward-facing statements in terms of specific features we're building. But but what will this enable in future? Where is this going? And, and kind of you know, the three to five years from now, what do you see? I think three to five years. Think of it as a trusted advisor to help with proficiency. We need you know, as individual to learn more uh, and to be proficient. You know, to be efficient in 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 how we do things. And I think the opportunity, the gains in 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 proficiency in in, in language mastery mm -hmm. are enormous because this the the language is so complex. So I think we will see this at scale, not just for AutoCAD, for other um, products. We're working on uh, insights for other products. Right. Very soon there will be other products, and we're working on more. In the next five years, there will be many more, uh, and we'll do this also across products to be able to give insights that cross the boundary of one product. But essentially insights that work at the workflow level. Insights that are not just about you as a user, but how you work as a team. You do something on your design that impacts one of your coworker mm -hmm. in ways you don't know because you're not close enough to them or they're using a different product. Mm -hmm. This, you know, we want to be able to learn that and give you some advice to say, you know, watch out, maybe there's something here that can help a coworker down the road, right? Because we can predict into that future mm -hmm. because we see we can see patterns. So it's super exciting. There's so much to do. It's a right? super exciting future, Nicola. I'm conscious of your time. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast today and help me understand all that stuff. I, I've learned a lot. I'm a re pleasure. Really excited. I'll talk to you again. Thanks.